Peace and blessings. This is Jock Kim from the Hard Talk with Jock Kim show. Can't get enough of the Hard Talk with Jock Kim show? You can email us at btom6164 at gmail.com. That's B-T-H-O-M-P 6164 at gmail.com. Peace. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Hard Talk with Jock Kim show. Peace and blessings. This is Jock Kim from the Hard Talk with Jock Kim show. Can't get enough of the Hard Talk with Jock Kim show? You can email us at btom6164 at gmail.com. That's B-T-H-O-M-P-6164 at gmail.com. Peace. Peace. This is Jock Kim from the Hard Talk with Jock Kim show. You can follow me on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter at the real Jock Kim. That's at the real Jock Kim. Remember, no punks allowed. Peace. We'll be right back with the Hard Talk with Jock Kim. Hey, peace and blessings. This is the Hard Talk with Jack Kim Show. And this is your man, Jack Kim. Listen, I've got a lot of stuff to go to. We're going to be talking about racism in medicine tonight. We're going to be getting into some real, real personal stuff that I've I've been meaning to get to you about a long time ago. About two years, I've been meaning to do a show about this topic, racism in medicine here in the United States and it's, and I suspect abroad as well. So this is your Hard Talk with Jack Kim show. Listen, this is where we showcase the good and we call out the bad and the rotten. So if you don't know, you can always get contact with us at btom6164 at gmail.com. That's B. T H O M P 6164 at gmail.com. If you got some topics, if you got some guests that you want us to put on tonight, we're not going to be dealing with any guests tonight because tonight is going to be a real personal and uh, I, I would say important topic racism in medicine. But before we go to there, man, we got to talk about what's going on during the week, man. So I, I see today. Uh, Mr. R. Kelly has got uh, 20 more years added to his sentence, but I think it was concurrent. So it's going to go with the sentence that he already has. And he's got 20 more years there. And that's just a sad situation. Uh, If you know anything about R. Kelly's music and know anything about his proclivities, allegedly proclivities, and I don't even say it's alleged anymore. He's been brought to justice. He's been brought to court. I don't know if it's justice. He's been brought to court and he's been convicted of these particular proclivities. It's a shame that so many of us fall to our basic and lesser nature. And that's what I'm going to say about the R. Kelly thing, y'all. And uh, we're going to move forward with that. Uh, We're going to be talking about, listen, we're going to be talking about racism in medicine. And it's an important topic. And it's a topic that I know something about. And I'm going to let you in on that. But before we go on to that, also, we want to talk about uh, East Palestine, Ohio. Now, if you've been watching any of my uh, uh, posts on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok, and remember, you can get me on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, I mean, Instagram, TikTok, and uh, let's see, uh, Twitter. <laughs> I say that very small, very slowly, and very uh, whispery, Twitter. You can get me at the real Jack Kim. That's the real Jack Kim. At the real Jack Kim. Oh yeah, let's let's talk about that for a second. Are you going to pay to have the blue check? Yes, Facebook has uh, Meta. Facebook has said that they are going to institute a 
uh, subscription to pay for the blue check. I don't know if any of my fellow Instagram people out there or any of the fellow Facebook people out there are willing to pay for that blue check. I don't know if you should. Hit me up at btom616 btom6164 at gmail.com. That's B T H O M P 6164 at gmail.com. I'd like to know how many of y'all are going to pay for that. Uh, $11.99, I believe. That's what they're calling it. So to get that, I don't know if that's good or bad or whatever. Uh, listen, you know, like I know, no one should escape criticism. Uh, proper criticism anyway, especially if you're a public official, you should never be able to think that you should escape uh, proper criticism. But let me just say this as well, before we dive into uh, racism in medicine, no one should think that they should be able to escape uh, proper criticism. And proper criticism isn't just from, isn't from your haters because your haters don't like you. So I don't give a crap about your haters. Don't ever give a crap about your haters. We're talking about proper criticism here. So let me just give you this here. I want you to check out this video. And this is one of the reasons why I, I got into doing this particular thing. It's not the main reason because I have some personal issues that I have to, uh, I'm going to address. And most of them is not so much with me, but most of it is with family members and friends that have gone through it. Uh, gone through the maze of the racism in medicine. But check out this video for a second. The hardest part is the wait. Sometimes I get anxious when my phone rings because I don't know if it's a call for a transplant. So I feel like my heart races every time I hear my phone ring. That call may come sooner for Higgins because of a national rule that will remove a test seen as racially biased in determining who gets a transplant. What's changing now is we have a growing awareness that inclusion of race variables is um, inaccurate to a large degree and also contributes to disparities in access to care. Historically, black patients have had to wait longer for kidney transplants than other races, in part because of an outdated test that overestimated kidney function in African Americans. The nation's transplant system is now banning that test and instructing every kidney transplant program to credit affected black patients with time. Black people are. All right, y'all. Listen, uh, big shout out to all the people that uh, did that report. And it was fantastic. It's NBC News. Uh, it, it, it was a it was a good report. It didn't really get to the meat of it. But let's talk about the issues right there. Now, there are some of you that are watching this program right now that are either on kidney dialysis or uh, have a kidney transplant. And uh, a, a large vast of you, not all of you, but a large vast of you are probably uh, African-American or black. Let me just say this to you all. And I'm going to be very, very, uh, I'm going to be very succinct with it. There has been a disparity in the kidney transplant um, in the United States for black folks for some time now. And when I know this one, this NBC report was talking about the test, but there has been a disparity and the disparity has been mostly... Um, racial to me. I know because I have a close family member who has a kidney transplant. And uh, whether it was up in New York uh, or down in, in uh, Pennsylvania area or down in the Maryland area, I have heard tons and tons of stories. Now, one of the things that happens when you have a close family member that has a kidney transplant or on kidney dialysis, you get to hear a lot of the horror stories from people and you get to see it. Now, you know, there's many kidney transplants. I think there's a uh, nationwide, there's like three of the major kidney transplants like um, 
Fresenius and Davida and I think U.S. transplant or uh, U.S. dialysis or something like that. And a lot of you are going there and you're getting on it like three, four times a week, depending on your diseases. I believe I'm not a medical doctor, but I will tell you this. And you're there for a number of hours. And it was almost uh, just killing people when the pandemic hit and people could not get to their kidney dialysis. I know we've lost lives there. I know we have. And um, I just want to tell you that uh, I want you to stand strong on that kidney dialysis. I want you to get your kidney transplant. I want you to be able to come off that kidney. But, you know, it's not over once you get a kidney transplant because now you have to deal with the medicines, the expensive part of medicine. We're going to talk about that. We, you got to deal with uh, pharmacy issues. You, you have to deal with the pharmacy issues. Anybody out there, white, black, brown, yellow, whatever, you know what I'm talking about if you're dealing with pharmacy issues. Whether you're dealing with the big boys, uh, Target, Rite Aid, CBS, Walgreens, uh, any other ones that's out there, you know, you that in itself is part of, of the racism that we have in medicine. Uh, the prices of these things. Let me just say, let me give you this, y'all. From this point on, if you're not out here being an advocate for yourself, if you don't have an advocate in the health care system, you're going to get screwed. Believe me, me right now. I don't want anybody in this supply chain of health care to feel comfortable. They don't need to feel comfortable. We need to start putting the heat on this health care system in the United States. We, there have been tries. There have been tries. I'm not going to lie that there hasn't been tries, whether it be the uh, the Affordable Care Act or anything else, but there hasn't been tried enough. I know that President Biden in his uh, State of the Union mentioned insulin, the cost of insulin, and he mentioned that, and they had a, a one sentence about the cost of medicine. I want to see the cost of medicine in the United States come down now. And we all know that if you are poor in this country and you're not at what they consider the poverty level, but still poor at the poverty level, you're the person that's in the middle, you're getting screwed the most. Not the rich, the super rich ain't getting screwed because they have the wealth. And the real, real, real poor ain't getting screwed because they real poor. It's the layer in the middle all the time that gets screwed the most. You know it. The working poor. You know it. If you're not making more than half a million dollars a year, and even then you're probably part of the working poor, you're not making more than it because, you know, how you live and your life thing, you're getting screwed. When you're in the middle, the middle gets screwed the most. So let me just go to here, y'all. Um, one of the things that I have a beef about, and I'm just going to talk about medicine, uh, is the lack of black doctors. Now, one of the things, one of our reports came in and says there's only 5.7% of the doctors in the United States are black. Now, that's not going to solve the problem if we get more black doctors. I'm going to tell you that why. And yes, you're going to say, what do you mean, Joachim? That's not going to solve the problem. Well, having more black police officers don't stop abuses by the police department, do it? Yes, there, and, and I'm telling you from a former law enforcement, yes, you will get one or two that's going to do the right thing, that's going to do the job based upon the rules and regulations of the job. And, of course, the moral code they live by. But then you're going to get the other ones that want to be accepted. Want to be accepted whatever which way they want. They, it's almost like they're being accepted in a sports team. 
I want to do whatever it is. I'll buy the biggest sports and name your biggest your, your biggest bread. Doesn't matter. I'm from New York. I was a big Yankee fan. I'm not a real sports fan anymore like that because I see the billionaires are getting paid and everybody else is getting screwed. But let me just say this. Um, I like to play sports as opposed to watch sports. So here's my point. When you say that we need a lot more black doctors, and I will say yes, and then I will put a butt behind it. But we need black doctors who are going to do and service the community. I don't need a black doctor who's just going to act racist like other doctors would. And I've been to great white doctors and I have been to subpar black doctors. So let me just say that we need more black doctors, but we need them to be able to serve the community. Just like the consortium in Philadelphia, big shout outs to the, uh, the Black Doctors Consortium in Philadelphia. They do a fantastic job. Let me just go here, and that's where I'm going to lead. Y'all know where I'm, I'm always trying to lead you to some place. So I had a very close family friend, family member of mine, not a family friend, very close family member. And I'm almost reluctant to talk about some parts of it because when you have a settlement in, in, um, the United States, usually if it's a medical settlement, it comes with disclosure, non-disclosure. You know it, I know it. A lot of times when you see settlements, they are not admitting to the wrongdoing. And a lot of times medical settlements the hospital, the doctors, the physicians, uh, the surgeons, whoever it is, uh, it could be your pharmacist. Their procedures may not change. They may pay you out and still keep those same procedures that have caused the injury to somebody. I'm going to tell you this. If you have a doctor and you are not writing in your journal about things, if you're in the hospitals and you're not having a piece of uh, a paper, a pen and paper on writing and keeping notes, you are silly. You better start learning how to keep notes when it comes to this stuff. Now, again, like I said, we have a personal family member that went through the, a particular thing. And uh, I'm going to tell you right now, here's a, it was with a black doctor. It's also, again, what I'm going to tell you is that at the time of, of this, procedures didn't change. You know why they didn't change? Because the system doesn't want change. Too many of us think we need to reform the system. Whether it be healthcare, whether it be judicial, whether, it, no, we need to have a new system. Because reforming the system doesn't work. It don't work. So again, the racism in medicine is, is prevalent. You know it and I know it. Now, let me just talk to you on something that a lot of people may not even be aware of. Have y'all noticed that during this so-called opioid crisis, nobody really talked about the pharmacist giving out medic medication? Oh, yes. Let's talk about the pharmacist. See, in the supply chain of medical care here in the United States, the pharmacist is the last uh, gatekeeper. The pharmacist is the last one that says, hey, you don't been here two or three times. You know, I, I, I've seen you were over here and you shouldn't have ran out of opioids. Something's going on here. 
But the pharmacist haven't been really sued, have they? The pharmacist hasn't really had to had to uh, to adhere to massive changes. I'm not saying that the that the healthcare system has some massive changes through Congress or whatever. What I am saying is the pharmacist, and you know it like I know it, the pharmacist now is big chain stores. It is the Walgreens, the CVSs, the Targets, the Walmarts. You know it, uh, the Rite Aids. You know it. They're the ones. Why hasn't there been some legislation towards them? I'm really thinking this, and if you if you have any comments, if you want to talk about it, just get in contact with me at btom6164 at gmail.com. That's btom6164 at gmail.com. Again, the pharmacist. The pharmacist is the last person that gives the medicine. They're the last checkpoint. They're the last gatekeepers. We've, we've got a problem in the United States. We've got a problem with the with the dominant power structure always thinking to give less regulations and make the company pay for it after. But the once the company pays for it after, it's not the same. You've hurt and injured people. Oh yeah, we we're, we'll talk about the the Republican response to East Palestine, the derailment. We'll talk about that, but let me just say, uh, racism in medicine will not be cured by having more black doctors. It is a part of the solution. And hear me out. It's part of the solution. It is not the end all to be all. I, and I really, really put it in the same vein as um, law enforcement. You know, there's explicit training that they get. And some of that explicit training that doctors get is based in racism. Just like we just saw in the report when they said they've been doing this particular variable, this particular test to show that black people have more kidney function than they actually have. And yet it put them on the waiting list a little further down for kidney transplant that now they're getting rid of that particular test. Well, you know, they should have got rid of it. And that inclusion of the race variable is part of the problem. We have a, a implicit bias training in the medical field that needs to be changed as well. So I'll be right back with the hard talk with Jack Kim. Check this out, y'all. Just, uh, just a little bit on purpose. I'm happy because I'm fulfilling my purpose of life. See, everything was created for purpose. Trees have a purpose. The moon has a purpose. Rats have a purpose. Insects, everything God created has a purpose. That's my another one of my lectures entitled The Purpose of Life. And the wise man is he who knows his life purpose. See, 10 men with the knowledge of their purpose are more powerful than a thousand men working from morning until evening and who don't know their purpose. All right, y'all. Peace and blessings. This is the Hard Talk with Jack Kim show. And this is a Black's Law Dictionary. It's an old one. It's a seventh edition one. But it is a Black. I went and bought a Black's Law Dictionary uh, some over 20-something years ago. Now, let me tell you why I'm going to talk about this. Let's talk about, real quick, uh, I saw somebody had a TikTok about why are we teaching our children out of the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, at the uh, whatever dictionary when we should be teaching our children in school out of the Black's Law Dictionary. Now, let me tell you why of the Black's Law Dictionary or any other law dictionary that you get, it not only have to be Blacks. Let me tell you the reason why I agree with that. Everything you get that is legal, that is about anything, is going to come out of that dictionary, not Webster. Not the Webster, not the Miriam one. It's going to come out of this dictionary. Why is that important? Because words that you think have this meaning, that you grew up in school thinking they have the meaning, when you open up that, that law dictionary, they have a different. And everything important, they are going to go to 
the law. So why are we teaching our children mostly the dictionary that the Daniel Webster and all that or Oxford dictionary when we probably should be teaching them this one or uh, to buy a house when they take you to court? What dictionary? What words are they going to be using out of what language? When you buy a car. When you buy a house, cars property, when you're doing a trademark infringement, when you're going to court, again, we're teaching uh, in our curriculums, in our schools, they are lacking. They're not teaching what you need to know to establish yourself in the real world. Real adulting, right here, when you get that letter for a uh, jury duty, and you don't show up. If you get a subpoena, that's where they're going. All the important things, when you're going to sue your credit card company, when you're going to sue your mobile company, when you're going to try to get money from some, all of that's coming out of there. So why are we concentrating on this so much? I don't mind, concert, I don't mind us spending a little bit of time. I don't mind us talking about William Shakespeare. I don't mind us talking about the arts. I don't mind. But this is extremely important. So let me just talk to my fat, my uh, people out there. If you do not have a law dictionary, if you can't get one and put it on a flash drive or a jump drive, you need to get it and get it now. Because when they take you to anything that's important in this world, they're going to be using words and phrases and meanings out of those books. All right, John, let's just go back to just a little bit more on the kidney transplant. And we're going to talk a little bit about cancer and the, the big C word. The hardest part is the wait. Sometimes I get anxious when my phone rings because I don't know if it's a call for a transplant. So I feel like my heart races every time I hear my phone ring. That call may come sooner for Higgins because of a national rule that will remove a test seen as racially biased in determining who gets a transplant. What's changing now is we have a growing awareness that inclusion of race variables is um, inaccurate to a large degree and also contributes to disparities in access to care. Historically, black patients have had to wait longer for kidney transplants than other races, in part because of an outdated test that overestimated kidney function in African Americans. The nation's transplant system is now banning that test and instructing every kidney transplant program to credit affected black patients with time. Black people are four times more likely to be diagnosed with kidney failure than white people. The median wait time for black patients added in 2014 was 64 months compared to 37 months for white patients. Pavlakis says black patients on the list should receive a letter from their transplant program, adding the average black patient could get a kidney between one and two years sooner than before. So again, yeah, you should be, if you're on the transplant list and, and, uh, I hope you get a transplant as soon as possible. Uh, if you're on a tra kidney transplant list uh, you, and you're black, you should probably uh, contact your kidney transplant office, whoever you're dealing with, and see about if you're moving up on the list to get a kidney transplant. Now, again, we're going to be dealing with medical, and I just told you about, uh, again, Black's Law Dictionary. Now, there's another book that you should have in your house. There's another book that you should be getting. There's another book that is important here because have, have been, having health is life. The other one is the physician disc, desk reference, the PDR. Man, I have a PDR. Let me tell you the reason why I have a PDR. The first time I went to a doctor and I was prescribed something that I had an adverse effect to, something made me say, man, I need to get more knowledge about this. 
And so I went out and got a PDR. Now, I'm not saying that you have to get a PDR every year, you know, because new drugs come on the market, new things come on it. And uh, and I'm not saying that you should get a medical degree. And I'm also, get ahead, this doesn't mean that you have a law degree. Just because you have a, a law dictionary doesn't mean that. You need to go to law school, pass the bar, the same thing with medical, you need to go there. But, and I'm going to be honest with you, you are required by the Lord Almighty to acquire as much knowledge as you possibly can. So if you don't have a PDR, if you didn't think about getting one, and if you're an adult, you're over the age of 21, I would advise you to get one. You'll be surprised on what you find in your PDR, just like you'll be surprised when you open up a uh, law dictionary and say, man, those meanings are different than what I was taught. Why is there so much Latin? You need it because when they come after you, they're going to be coming after you with that, not with that great English grammar that you thought was one of the meaning. Uh, and, and no disrespect to any of our English teachers. Love you to death. I always excelled in English. Uh, but uh, as an adult, you need to have to acquire as much knowledge as you can. And as anybody who is going through things like this, PDRs, physician desk references, things as much as you can buy. We live in the most uh, information time ever. So you got to get as much information. All right. So I did say in one of my uh, emails that I got this week, somebody wanted me to talk a little bit because they know my, my wife does health insurance. Uh, wants to talk about um, health insurance. All right, so let me just give you this. It is a maze to go through health insurance. Once you turn 65 in this country uh, and you ain't on the ball, you're going to be behind the eight ball. So if I'm going to, now I'm going to talk to everybody who's in their 50s and above. If you're in your 50 and above, I'm going to talk to you right now. You need to learn this system and understand this system changes almost every year. So you really need to learn this system. You really need to learn what doctors you want, need to go to, what your dentist, your eye care. Remember, a lot of that is not covered. Some of it is covered. You need to know what the Medicaid and Medicare, the difference of Medicare. Event. You need to learn this system. Now, what did I just say? Did I just tell you that you need to learn this system? Let me let me coach you up a little bit. Yes, you need to learn this system. This is not the time to sit on your butt and binge watch Netflix or Apple TV or Disney Plus. This is now the time for you to learn the system. If you're over 50, you better start learning the system now. I'm going to coach you up about this. Because too many of us, and I'm saying this from personal experience, by the time they get 62, 63, 64, or 65 or 70 and they're retiring, they call up with questions that they already should know. They call up and they don't know basic information. This system is complicated. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to tell you right now, the system is complicated. It's meant to be complicated so that you don't get your full benefits. But if you right now, and I'm going to tell you right now, if you are 65 and older or 64 approaches 65, and you do not get on the ball about this system, and you do not acquire as much knowledge as you possibly can, you are going to be behind the eight ball. You might be checking out of this life a lot sooner because you're going to get subpar medical care. Get a PDR. Now, I just talked to you again. Black's Law Dictionary 
or any law dictionary out there, because remember, anything you do as an adult, when they sue you, when you purchase anything, they're going to be taking it out of there and they're not going to be taking it out of Shakespeare. You, you, they're not going to be taking it out your favorite drama. It's going to be coming out of the law dictionary, the law. I'm not telling you to go get a law degree right now, but I am telling you to be an adult. And second other book you better start getting is a physician desk reference, a PDR. You better start learning when somebody uh, prescribe you some medicine. You better go and see what the side effects are. You better go and because a lot of times um, the racism in medicine happens. Sometimes it's not just racism. Sometimes it's just pure T greed. That's what it is. And thirdly, if you get approaching those age, you're over 50, you better start thinking about Medicare. You better start thinking about Medicare plans. You better start learning the system. You got a, you got a lot of stuff to do. So if you're over 21 years old, I recommend you get a law a lot, a, go get a law dictionary. I also recommend that you get a PDR. And if you're over 50, you need to really get started. Get right now started to learning the difference between Medicare, Medicaid, and all of the other stuff there. I told you what happens with, with dialysis. I told you about the big C. Let me just talk to you all just a little bit about the big C. Cancer. When cancer comes into your life, it wrecks your life. You know it and I know it. Cancer is a game changer. Anytime. Now, that doesn't mean that hypertension is not a game changer. That doesn't mean heart disease is not a game changer. That doesn't mean other diseases out there, MS, aren't a game, game changer. But cancer is the game changer. Cancer is the big C for one reason. We don't have a cure for cancer. Oh, yes. I know some of you are going to say, yeah, they cured this one. They got something there. Let me tell you something. They can treat it. They can, but that doesn't mean that it goes away and that you will be cancer free and never have to worry about it again. So since we know this, since we know that in oncology, there's racism in oncology as well. Since we know that racism is systemic, it's not just in, in healthcare, but it's in all of medicine. And when I say all of medicine, from the time that you're prescribed, uh, or from the time you get treatment or go to your physician, to the time that you actually get the pills or the, the so-called cure in your hand, that whole supply chain. Greed and racism is embedded into the system. Now, I know some of you have had malpractice suits. Remember, I told you that a family member of mine uh, had a malpractice suit. And uh, again, I would tell you that it was a black doctor. So again, we don't just need black doctors. We need black doctors who are not going to uh, mandate the implicit bias that they get in their training and that come into the communities to serve the community. You know it like I know it. And like earlier I told you, five point is, is rumored. I don't know how much these figures are, but 5.7 to almost 6% of doctors in the United States are black. Only 6%. That's a very low number. And then out of that, how many of them are good? So having more black doctors is part of the solution. It is not the end all the be all. It's like having more black cops is not just the solution. Y'all know it. If you know anything about the Tyree uh, Nichols case, you know um, we need more than reform in these systems. We need to change the systems. Okay, I'm going to leave it right there, y'all. So in, in my dealings, in my family, and I'm going to just give you another thing. I have members of my family that have had sickle cell anemia. 
I do not have a trait of sickle cell, but members of my family do. Uh, we're talking about cousins, third, second, and stuff like that. Um, sickle cell anemia. I have seen nothing but racism as a, as trying to fix this particular one because it's not affecting uh, most of the power structure population. If you know an organization that's doing sickle work in sickle cell anemia, go talk to them. They'll let you know. If I have I've had a a second cousin uh, in the last three four years who died from sickle cell anemia. Bad case. So you know it that particular things like that hypertension, um, sickle cell anemia. You know these things that affect the black community that. In some cases, in most cases, we are getting subpar treatment. So I'm going to leave you on that with racism in medicine. I'm going to do a number two when I have actual guests on here. I just wanted to give you some of the personal stuff. Somebody said, oh, my God, Jack Kim, are uh, you going to put out even more good, uh, good content? And I had to tell him, I said, thank you, but uh, I don't put out content. I am the content. So you got it right here. Let me just leave you with, uh, again, with, uh, with Dr. Ritchie. And I wanted to leave you again with what he said about the Tyree Nichols thing. And remember, uh, it's not out of my mind. Oh, yes. Let me just, let me just say this about uh, guns in America. Let's go with the guns in America. And we all know that the big killer of guns, a uh, big killers of children now are guns. And I'm going to look dead in the camera and let you know this. When Sandy Hook happened, yes, some of you are going to talk about Columbine and other shootings before then. But let's just talk about Sandy Hook. I think Sandy Hook is over 10 years now. When Sandy Hook happened, if there was not going to be the discussion on assault rifles and and the accessibility to these weapons. After Sandy Hook, when kindergartens and first graders and, and really young kids are being killed and didn't move forward to Uvalde, and of course, Buffalo, New York, we're never going to forget that. But when that happened and no change, no real change happened at all on the federal and the state and local level, when they are allowing kids to be killed, you can forget you're ever going to get gun control. We just had another one, and we have another one. When Sandy Hook and nothing changed, you can forget it. If you're allowing the kids to be mowed down by choppers, when they be mowed down by choppers, you know they don't give two jacks about you or this or whatever. What and, and and look at the look at the array of perpetrators of these crimes: sixty-year-olds, seventy-year-olds, fifteen-year-olds, thirteen-year-olds, black, white, anti uh, anti-government, and and, and and just knuckleheads. Let's see what you're going to do, America. If I was a betting man, and you know I do, if I was a betting man, I would bet nothing changes. Nothing changes. All right, y'all. So listen, man, this has been your man, Jack Kim Muhammad, with the hard talk with Jack Kim. I'm going to leave you with again with Dr. Richie uh, uh, about having <laughs> a, a black police chief. Check this out. I'll see you next week, man. We got some guests next week. I'll see you. Remember, btom6164 at gmail.com. That's B-T-H-O-M-P 6164 at gmail.com. You can check me out on Twitter, on TikTok, you, and you can check me out on Instagram at the real Jaquim. That's at the real Jaquim. Let me know if you're going to uh, uh, buy the blue check mark. I want to know how many people are actually going to uh, get spend that $11.99 a month uh, to get the blue check mark on Instagram or Facebook. All right, y'all. Dr. Richie, catch you on the flip side. Peace. Many times when a white male or even a white female is charged, there's an effort.
to either minimize the charges to the bare minimum or not overcharge at all. But then an African American is charged, black or brown person. There's this sentiment to overcharge them to make the charges extreme, knowing many of them would not stick and then making them fight to get those charges dropped. I'm sure you've seen that as somewhat of a routine now in many criminal justice systems throughout the country. I mean, we've seen it in a lot of the the cases that we've covered here. And you know, I think a big part of that and how you address that is having more diverse prosecutors in a prosecution office, right? Because you know, prosecutors only bring charges they think they can win because their reputation is on the line. And prosecutors usually like to say that they are kind of like undefeated, right? Or that they have won every Whenever you have a combination of alcohol, guns, drugs, egos. Hold on, let's not forget about the, the, the two most deadly diseases in our community, envy and jealousy. You have a combination or a cocktail where somebody's bound to get hurt. So what I'm teaching my mentees right now is that there's a such thing as being in the wrong place at the wrong time. When you're in an arena and, and, and there's alcohol and things are beginning to escalate, it's time to go. Mm -hmm. It's time to go. There's always so much sympathy for folks like that. People say, well, I have a cousin who feels that way. She's not so bad. My aunt voted for Donald Trump and she's a nice person. My mother supports him. She doesn't like his tweets, but she's not terrible. Here's the news flash. Your aunt, your mother, your grandmother, whoever supports that philosophy, they actually are terrible people. That actually is garbage when you support racism. It doesn't matter how related you are, but we extend humanity to folks like that. And so little humanity for folks who look like us. When you encounter